thank you all for coming. Really, it's, uh, again, I, I, I've said this at many events, but it's, it's no less true with this one. It's just amazing to put a date on the calendar and show up in a theater and have all of you come out. It's really, it's an immense privilege, and uh, thank you for coming out. Lift weights in order to pour your water, Brian. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I think we're going to start, uh, kind of a natural place to start is just to talk about what do we think we know and why we think we know it. I, mean, I think, you know, from a, uh, and, and then ultimately why any of that matters, you know, why being right or wrong or close enough matters. Um, for me, it, it, it's, you know, coming from more of a, a life science and philosophy of mind background, that the thing that, that strikes me as the, the potential hubris of our whole enterprise is that there, there is a, a clear scientific rationale for being skeptical about our powers to know what's going on here. And that's, I mean, if you just take evolution as your starting point, there's no reason why apes like ourselves should know a damn thing about what's going on here despite the fact that, our, that our, our science and, our, and the technology that it spawns is incredibly useful, and we, we seem to be playing a language game with ourselves, one that's augmented by the language of mathematics, that is producing less ignorance and more knowledge. I mean, it seems to be pushing back the frontier of, so, of, of something that is fundamentally bewildering. There's, there's a mystery that we confront. We don't understand why we get sick and then we discover viruses and bacteria, and I mean, there seems to be progress, right? But it's just, there, there is no reason to expect that the, the intuitions we rely on to do science should be fitted to reality in any deep way. Because if, if we look at our you know, chimpanzee cousins, it's obvious not only do they not know a damn thing about what's going on, they couldn't possibly know a damn thing about what's going on. And we are just a slight iteration beyond them as a matter of you just you know, uh, uh, apes having evolved. So wh where do you as a scientist uh, get your, your confidence that the, the game you play as, as a physicist in particular is actually bringing you and other physicists close in, into closer context, in contact with yeah. you? Yeah. Well, I mean, I share certainly a lot of that intuition. In fact, um, you know, I had a, a, a TV show many, many years ago where uh, it was on the first book I wrote, and there was one scene where I'm at a blackboard lecturing on the general theory of relativity, and clearly I'm lecturing to a student that's not quite getting it, and the camera slowly pans, and it's a dog. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> unfortunately, I got so many people, the response was they thought I was trying to say the audience was like the dog, which, which right. wasn't the point. The point was exactly the one that you're making, which is dogs are these intelligent creatures, but yet there's a limit to what they can understand. And we think that they don't understand, for instance, the general theory of relativity. And every time I say that, I always think maybe the dogs are out there that oh, they think we don't understand general relativity. <laughs> but, you know. uh, but assuming that's not the case, uh, here, here we have a, a, a very good example of smart beings that are limited in what they can understand. So why is it that we aren't in the same boat and presumably we are in the same boat? So, so I think that's a given, that we may be limited in what we can understand, but to the specifics of your question, why is it that we think we're making progress? It's very straightforward. We can sit down with the equations of quantum electrodynamics and calculate properties of electrons. They're magnetic properties, the details don't really matter, but the calculation agrees with the measurement decimal by decimal by decimal, 10 places after the decimal point. Right. That's enough. I'm done. I mean, you know, <laughs> think about that. That is an astonishing fact that these strange gloppy things inside of our head can figure out the mathematics to, to understand the property of a particle to one part in, in a billion. Mm. And it agrees with measurement. And at that point, you say to yourself, for some reason that we can't quite understand, mathematics provides this powerful illumination into the dark qualities of the universe and allows us to make progress on questions that don't seem to have any relevance to survival, 
right? But yet somehow the brain has gotten to the point where it can figure these things out. And I shouldn't even say, it's not even, not just they don't have relevance to survival. One imagines that back on the savannah, those of our forebears who got caught up thinking about black holes and quantum physics, they got eaten, head, yes. right? Yeah. You know, so it's like not good for us right. to do this, but yet somehow we're able to. Yeah, well, we have the, the, the last scene that we know about where that was almost certainly true was Archimedes in his bathtub. Yeah, that's making, a curious making one. Making some more breakthrough in, in geometry, and then a Roman soldier just came in and impaled him. Uh, so, first rule of self-defense, you, you stop with the math when someone kicks down your door. Uh, so, oh, so, let's. I just want to revisit some of the points you just made there, because so people have made... I've, I've, I've heard, I've been a consumer of skeptical utterances on this very topic, so I think yeah. I, there was one uh, popular book on physics I read years ago, I think it was probably a John Gribben book, uh, and it was, he, he said in there that, this, that there's, there's a famous paper by uh, Wigner, I, I believe, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics and the Natural Sciences, or something close to that title. Yes, that's right. And so it's, it's been pitched as this mystery that mathematics, is, uh, seems to map onto reality in a way that is surprising and counterintuitive, and we're, we're still just trying to make sense of that. But I think it was Gribben who wrote that, actually, the, the idea that mathematics, is it, that it's surprising that mathematics maps onto reality is a little bit like saying it, it's surprising that the English language is, is so good for writing plays in. Right, that there's like, like, like th this is the thing we're, th we're using and we're finding ways to fit it to the circumstance we're in. That is, it seems, it seems to me that there may be a, a serious disanalogy there in that in mathematics, unlike English, seems to indicate, it seems to make predictions about what should be so. I mean, the relationship between electricity and magnetism, say, um, which then can be tested and proven to be true, that the mathematics yeah. itself sort of shines a light in a direction we weren't necessarily looking. Right. Is, there, is, is that one, is that valid, but is, is, is there more to it than that? Uh, I don't think there's more to it than that, but that's a, a breathtaking quality, yeah. right? I mean, the fact that you, know, you use English to articulate thoughts and describe situations, sure, that's the mode that we have developed for that kind of communication. But mathematics is not a natural language, right? Mathematics is a way that we have found of encapsulating pattern in the world. But yet, when we have identified the pattern, we can then use it to go far beyond the context in which it was developed. So, you know, Einstein is thinking about space and time and, and the special theory of relativity, 1905, 1906, 1907. Then he takes this mathematics off the shelf in about 1912, a body of mathematics called Ramanian geometry that was largely developed in an abstract realm of mathematics to describe curved shapes, the kind of thing that the idle mathematical mind might find interesting, but not because we were trying to describe the external world. He takes that mathematics, is able to work with it into this generalized version of relativity, the general theory of relativity, and then make predictions about how stars in the distant night sky should look when their light traverses near the sun. Mm. And the way that those positions of the stars shift is then borne out by photographs taken four years later during a solar eclipse when the stars become visible. Yeah. That, that's the craziness. Right? He wasn't trying to describe the motion and the position shifting of those stars, and yet he was able to make a statement about something that he had never received any data on, and it agreed with subsequent measurements. Right. That's the part that is absolutely thrilling. Well, so there, there are physicists and mathematicians that have a quasi-mystical, quasi-platonic notion about it, the significance of all this. Like, so, so what's your explanation, if you have one, for why math seems to reach into the, the darker corners of reality for us? I sort of look at it two ways, and it kind of depends on, on how a given day is going, you know, when you're doing the calculations. I mean, sometimes it feels like you're just sort of 
chipping away at the stone, revealing the beautiful sculpture as if it's already out there and all you're doing is revealing it. Other days when it's not going so well, it just feels like you're desperately trying to invent the ideas in order to be able to make progress. So I kind of go back and forth between the two. I have to say I don't have a consistent view of the role of mathematics in this regard. And I would even say there are times when I have, I don't know if worried is the right word, but I've imagined the possibility that one day we make contact with an alien civilization and they say, hey, show us what you guys have figured out. And we bring out the textbooks with all of our beautiful equations and they kind of look at it and they go, nah. They put you in a video where you're the dog. <laughs> yeah, right, they basically, yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, they, they basically say, you know, we, we tried that for a while, it's kind of a dead end, guys. It'll take you just so far. Yeah. But then the funny thing is, if I try to imagine what they would replace it with, I don't even, I can't even think of what they would replace it with that isn't in some sense mathematics, perhaps in an unrecognizable form, or an unfamiliar form, perhaps a better way of saying it, because if math is a language of pattern, what are we doing? We're all just trying to encapsulate pattern. So whatever language you use to do that, maybe that is what math ultimately should be described as and therefore will always be back to this kind of structure. Right. There's another physicist who I've spoken with on my podcast a couple of times, David Deutsch, who I know you know. Um, and I, for, uh, forgive me, David, I've forgotten the reason why you believe this, but I believe he thinks that we are... Um, we're, there, in principle, we, we as math using language forming cognitive systems are not cognitively closed to anything that could be known given, I mean, I, th I think it has in his mind something to do with, with a, a, a deep result around information theory and the universality of computation. I mean, it, but I, I, I don't think I can represent his view faithfully here, but he, the, the net result is he thinks that the notion that we could meet an alien intelligence or build a super intelligent computer that we couldn't understand on some level, that where we would stand as the dog in relation to that super intelligent system, he thinks that's a, a, uh, a false fear or, or just in principle impossible. Do you have any reason to, to feel that? Or? I mean, I have to understand more fully exactly what he's saying, but I mean, clearly, if you take our very species and you just you know, wind the clock back, however far you want to go, 30,000 years, 50,000 years, 70,000 years, I mean, there would be a cognitive mismatch relative to where we are today. Yeah. So it's certainly the case that given enough time, we can get to the point, obviously, here we right. are. But I could certainly imagine that we encounter an alien intelligence and they are exponentially beyond anything that we have understood and therefore we would be like ants. Yeah. And in fact, I think that's a good possibility as to why they're not paying attention to us. Well, I, th I think that's part of his argument, yeah. I, I actually, that takes me exactly where I want to go. But I think that is part of his argument that we're given enough time or given enough you know, augmentation of ourselves, we could fuse our cognitive horizon with anything else that we could meet. Um, but on, so on that point, where the hell is everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 maybe you, you can remind people what the Fermi problem is and, and then tell us what you... Yeah, uh, you know, and, Enrico Fermi, a uh, great physicist, uh, is credited with, it's usually framed as the Fermi paradox, I guess, uh, which is, look, there's so many stars out there, so many, in fact, now we know for, for a fact that there are so many planetary systems out there, therefore you expect there's a lot of life out there, where are they? Why haven't they come and visited us? It's sort of a you know, quick way of describing uh, the question. And, um, but yeah, I think uh, uh, it's an interesting thought to, to contemplate. I think there are many, many explanations for, for why they haven't come here. It could be, like I was saying, we're just not interesting enough, right? I mean, how many times do we stop on the street and, and, and have conversations with bacteria, right? So if we're bacteria, you know, they're like, let's wait, you know, you know, a billion years, and maybe at that point we'll pay some attention. But there are other explanations too. I mean, maybe uh, life is rare, right? I mean, we always have this idea in mind, I think, that at this point, 
life is commonplace, well, we don't know that. Or maybe life is commonplace, but intelligent life is rare, right? I mean, if that asteroid hadn't smashed into us 65 million years ago, who knows? Maybe it's still dinosaurs walking around, and they're not building radio telescopes and sending out spaceships. You know, the other possibilities are, are, are legion. I mean, the universe now, 92 billion light years across, the observable universe in terms of the things that we've had called a contact with, we have traveled one and a half light seconds <laughs> from Earth. We have sent out probes that have gone out, I don't know, five or six light hours. Right. So to say, why aren't they here? The universe is a big place. And it's not so easy to travel over large distances if you're constrained by the barrier of the speed of light. So what, what's, the, what's our furthest impact on the universe? Just bad television from 70 years ago? Is that? Uh, yeah, so, so if you take, well, seven, so, no, I mean, I guess TV, you know, radio signals. Go, right. go back to, say, to 1900. Something. So maybe, you know, generously, 150 light years, if you allow, you know, any transmission that we sent out there. That's so 150 awesome. light years compared to, you know, 92 billion light years, yep. right? That's not much. Although I, I, the intuition is that if, because if you, you look at the, the fact that we have gone from you know, barely walking upright to sending out our own space probes in a very short period of time, so you know, 300 years of, of practical science, really. Yeah. And if you think of any, so, so I guess the one assumption you need is that there's nothing really special about Earth. And more and more, it seems that the sense, I mean, even 10 years ago, Earth seemed more special than it does now. Now we're finding planets every day that are seemingly in, in a, some kind of Goldilocks zone with respect to their star. And so if you don't think the conditions on Earth are so special, that they're really a, a dime a dozen out there in the galaxy and in other galaxies, and then you think the, just we're talking about a time window of, you know, any, any, place where life gets going and, and it gets complex is very likely on, it could, could be millions of years on either side of us. Anything, anything that's complex that could build a civilization, you know, is, is not going to, that is very unlikely to have happened in the last 300 years. They, yeah. they, they might as well have, you know, 300 years plus 10 million years to have gotten that going, right? So then you, you would expect just the galaxy to be awash in something that we could detect, right, that has been going on for millions of years. Um, I guess the one, the, the one additional wrinkle that, that we haven't mentioned is that there could just be something about building a complex civilization, building technology that is lethal yep. to species like ourselves. A absolutely. It could be that they're... We're you know, showing every a... sign of it being, being dangerous. Uh, yeah, right, right, yeah. right, exactly. I mean, it could be that once you get to the point where you're able to undertake these kind of grand space journeys, you're in a very dangerous situation, and typically you don't survive. Um, there, are, there are more optimistic ways of, of explaining it, though, too. So maybe the universe is teeming with all this activity, it's just not in the wavelengths that we're looking. We're just not right. sensitive to it, right? Maybe the time scales over which the vibrations of whatever medium that they're using are, are incredibly long or incredibly short. So we just hear it as like noise in the background and don't recognize that there's a signal or we don't even have any sensitivity to it at all. Right. So, so that, I think- Their bad television is coming at a different frequency? It could well be. Right, you know, um, so, so I, don't, I don't consider it a paradox. I think it's an interesting point of departure in trying to understand whether we're special, whether life is special, whether intelligence is special. But I mean, from your perspective, right, um, uh, let's say life is commonplace. The journey from life to intelligence is non-trivial. Do you think yeah. that is uh, as straightforward as you might assume in order to come to the conclusion that there should be all sorts of intelligence out there. Well, looking at Earth, you wouldn't draw that conclusion. I mean, Why? Even, even Why do you say that? How well, many species are there on this planet? Well, no, I'm saying, I'm, I, so I, I think I'm agreeing with you. Oh, good. Yeah, okay. that it's, it, 
No, I mean, I'm, the truth is, I'm even, it's non-trivial even if you look at our own species. Yes, that, that, that's the point. You know? Good, yeah. 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 Uh, you know, if, if uh, you murdered the top, if, if, you, if you took, so how many people on Earth at this moment deeply understand the science required to build intelligent machines, right? So if they, if they all caught a bad virus and died off, how long would it take just the people left to reinvent the computer, right? right. That's a, that's a non-trivial problem for most right. of us. I mean, if you, if you leave me alone on a desert island with the, you know, the necessary elements, you're, still, you're not gonna get a, an iPhone anytime soon. Uh, <laughs> and um, so that, I mean, the, it, in some sense, we're all, we're all living on the shoulders of, you know, if not giants, on the shoulders of, of legacy institutions and, and ways of doing things that it would be very hard for anyone to recapitulate. I mean, any, even any group of, of especially talented, qualified people, uh, you know, just, you, just you, you forget how to go you know, yeah. mine the ore that you need to make that you know, the circuit, right? Uh, so, and that's even assuming the existence of us humans already. I mean, yeah. if you just get rid of that whole particular branch, then you don't even have anything heading in that direction. Yeah, yeah. So it, 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 it strikes me as incredibly tenuous and fragile, yeah. right? Uh, so, and by no means uh, guaranteed to, to keep happening. Uh, because, again, I mean, the thing that's, that's interesting is that it's, it, it doesn't... What, what we're using to do everything that makes us human is not obviously better from a Darwinian perspective as a matter of survival. I mean, because, you know, again, in the long run, we could wind up killing ourselves. Uh, and there are many things that have persisted as themselves, as, you know, as discrete species for tens of millions of years you know, you take something like a lobster, right? Now, lobsters are just doing their lobster thing year after year after year, uh, and they seem to be fine unless we wind up you know, eating too many of them or destroying their environment. Uh, we, there, there's something uh, quite a bit more precarious about, about our place in the world, and uh, yeah, so it's not, a, even just as a map on purely Darwinian grounds, it's not like this surfeit of intelligence and abstract thought is, is clearly something that evolution is an attractor that evolution will keep finding because it's, it's just so good for a right. matter of survival. Right. No, I agree. And I think that's a very natural explanation, uh, not the most uh, optimistic of ones, but yeah. certainly is an explanation. Well, I'm rarely accused of optimism, so... <laughs> so... Uh, he optimistically asks, uh, what worries you at this moment in human history? <laughs> when you look at how we as a species think about reality and how to live within it, what do you, uh, I, I, you know, you and I don't know each other well at all. I don't know, are, are, do you pay attention to things in the culture even relevant to your science? Like is, is the fact that, uh, nuclear proliferation, the prospect of nuclear war, either by design or by accident, the fact that's almost not talked about at all now, and yet every moment of our lives we've been living under this same sort of Damocles. Is that something that you spend time thinking about? Or no. No? Is that, no. Well, no, it's, it's an honest answer, if, if true, but are, are, you, are you not part of any meetings of physicists that, that worry about that? Yeah, or? you know, um, yeah, it's facetious. Uh, so, so, but the truth is, I mean, the, the horror is that it's actually true for, right. for most of us. I mean, like, we, we have gone to sleep on this issue. Well, I, I would say that that is, is a reasonable description of, of me. I mean, I'm obviously, we all are aware of these issues. I think about these issues. I, I don't, from a day-to-day -day perspective, worry about these issues, nor from a day-to-day -day perspective do I work on these right. issues. Um, and um, it could well be that we have lulled ourselves into a state of complacency by virtue of nothing, you know, catastrophic, you know, happening yesterday or the day before. Uh, I do, you know, walk around the world with an optimistic sensibility yeah. that uh, we will find ways to deal with these issues, but um, that 
can be a masquerade for an unfortunate complacency at the same time. Hmm. So what, what are the, if you could list the problems that you felt we needed to address, if we could, if we could get our priorities straight, what's near the top of your list in terms of? Well, the obvious ones that we would all, I think, put there, uh, you know, we can rattle them off. You started with uh, nuclear proliferation, issues of uh, clean energy, issues of uh, environmental catastrophe, uh, ones, you know, that we just, you know, we were briefly touching upon, you know, when we had dinner just a couple hours ago, issues of, you know, AI, uh, which I would even frame in a, in a, in a somewhat more general um, uh, paradigm, which is, I don't think we're very good at having the intuition about exponential growth. Yeah. It's just not something that we're really good at. I mean, um, you know, everybody, this is a self-selected audience, but anybody who has never heard of, you know, the standard example where, you know, you get a penny on the first day and two pennies on the second and four on the third and so, you know, anybody who hasn't heard that before and learns that by the end of the month you've got a billion dollars plus, right. they're like, what? You know, everybody here knows that, but everybody who's not seen that before, it's very surprising. So I think the scariest things are those which have um, an exponential growth and we're not paying attention to them sufficiently early and we get whacked by the exponential uh, growth of some quality of the world that uh, needs our attention and we didn't give it attention early enough in the process. Mm. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, AI is a possibility along those lines, you right. know? So you, you um, take the notion of a, an intelligence explosion or a, a, some kind of singularity, some kind of breakaway of AI, uh, you take that seriously? You know, I, I would say I take it seriously. It's not something that I, that I fear. I don't deeply fear it. And again, I question my own self about that. Should I be fearing it more? And if I ask myself why I don't, it's because I think fundamentally, fundamentally I think, that the people who are responsible for the innovation that, for instance, may yield you know, an intelligence that at some point may far outstrip us, it feels to me that the people leading the charge on that are fundamentally good people. I know these people. Some of the, you know, I just feel that they're good people and that ultimately they will pay attention to the safety issues that need to be thought through. Now, this you is can on, say their, that, on their 12th Red Bull. It, it could be, it could be, you know, um, and, and, uh, and, you know, we have examples in the past where we thought doomsday was upon us, you know, you know, nuclear weapons, you know, I mean, there, there are moments where it looked like we were at the precipice and we have found a way to survive, and I guess that has given me an optimistic sensibility. Uh, it's been challenged, you know, November 8, 2016, it was challenged, it continues yeah. to be challenged, you know, uh, but, but I think fundamentally I'm still in the same place. Right. Well, you're, you're a New Yorker, you'll be fine, right? Yeah, uh, yeah well, so I will not take the, uh, the orange bait there. Uh, so, well, but to speak generically about politics and kind of culture war issues. So you, I think you and I take a different line here. So I've spent a lot of time arguing for, uh, specifically about the, the there's, there being a kind of zero-sum contest between religion and science, right? Or believing things for good reasons and believing things for bad reasons, or uh, flip that around. Yeah. Um, and you, ha you haven't. I think you've been loath to hit them against one another in a way that will reliably turn people off to science. If you tell people that they, you know, they can't have their resurrection and their cosmology too, a significant number of Americans will say, well, okay, fuck your cosmology, I, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll stick with Jesus. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, obviously you're not alone in that, but so like, for, one, do you acknowledge that that's a difference between the way we have kind of played the, the game intellectually? Um, I think so. Yeah. Um, it'd be good to, you know, if, if that's something you want, we probably should, you know, expand on that somewhat, but, but I think that's the case. And, um, um, you know, my feeling from the outside, watching, and I, I don't even mean to put you in this group, because this may not be accurate, but I've certainly seen uh, 
certain members of the science community going out into the world in a way that I consider um, ineffective right. uh, toward their own stated goal, and that feels irrational to me. Uh, you know, to go out into the world and tell people that you're stupid for certain kinds of beliefs um, strikes me as not the best strategy, right? I mean, you know, the strategy that I feel works is to go out into the world with a passion and enthusiasm for the things that you think are, are good to understand and important to understand and point in a, in a, in a valuable direction and to hope that the energy and the momentum from those kinds of conversations will drive things in a good direction. I've never felt the need to go out into the world and slap down other things. Right. That's not how I want to spend my time, and I've never found that an effective approach. Yeah, well, it, it, I, mean, I, I totally understand that. I think there are some, so, so having taken uh, the other line, and, and now I have, a, <laughs> I have a fair amount of experience with this, um, I, I can tell you that there, there are a few myths here that, that could, could be and perhaps should be retired. One is the idea that, that it simply never works, right? That you can never reason someone out of something they weren't reasoned into, you know? So, Someone you know, was born to a faith, they've had it drummed into them by their parents, they're now massively attached to it emotionally. Yeah. They, get, they, they get to adulthood, it's still the most important thing in their life. They've taught their children to believe likewise. There's, you, can't tell, you can't reason that person out of these, this set of, these sets of convictions. Uh, that's just untrue because I hear from these people all the time who have watched some debate or watched some video no matter how uh, offensive at first glance, uh, th they're susceptible to just seeing the, the bad evidence and the bad arguments that have been propping up their faith, you know, low these many millennia. But not to interrupt, let yeah. me just quickly say that I, I agree with the capacity to shift people's attitudes, perspectives, beliefs, because right. I've had those experiences too, but I've done it a different way. And when I've gotten people coming up to me or writing me emails saying, you know, now that I understand the fundamental workings of the universe a little bit better and understand the cosmology that the other person might have pushed off, but now that I have an understanding of what modern science is saying about these things, I just find it thrilling. And the other things that used to find, find gratifying no longer are working yeah. for me. Well, that, so I mean, so I've seen that too. Right, no, but, that, but that's, you're talking about the carrot and I'm still talking about the stick on some Yes, point. I agree. <laughs> So, but, but I totally I'm, get it. I'm saying the stick also works, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know so, and but I guess what I'd say to you is, if the stick works and the right. carrot works, first I think they're probably working on different people. Let's put that to the side for right. a moment. Which would you rather use? <laughs> I found. And you, I'm saying. I found you can only hit someone so hard with a carrot. Well, <laughs> and and I found you don't need to hit them at all. Well, so, but I, I should just say, so for instance, just to kind of prep you for your, I think, did, did, I think Travis just announced that you're doing a, an event with Dawkins, right? Yes, that's okay, correct. Okay, so I'm, I'm preparing you for your, your Thank you, appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Much appreciated, but I've had conversations in a public setting with him before, yeah. but that's okay. Yeah, yeah. please, so, please come. No, but I heard, I heard his, um, I, I heard him over my shoulder when you were talking about the generic, uh, offensive atheist who, who wasn't necessarily me. It might have been Richard. <laughs> uh, but I'm just saying, I'm sure he's sitting on tens of thousands of emails from people who sure. can honestly say, you know, though, though I thought you were an offensive bastard at the beginning, you actually argued me out of my most cherished beliefs. So that, I'm just saying, as a matter of sociology, that happens, right? Yeah, sure. now, but yet it's counterintuitive. We all know that there is this phenomenon, I mean, that we, this has actually been been now uh, studied up to a point, this, this notion of a backfire effect, where you, when you challenge people's beliefs, and you, even when you, you, when you provide them with counter evidence to those beliefs, they, there's some part of the, the human nervous system that just doubles down in the face of, of counter evidence, and they leave this confrontation believing what they believe even more uh, ardently than they did in the first place. So that, that happens. Uh, but 
I guess it's, I mean, in part it's a matter of taste. It's certainly a matter of just how you want to spend your time. I, I completely get that you don't want to be the guy who is just the go-to guy for, you know, why you can't have your, your cake and eat it too in the matter of, of science versus religion. But uh, have you ever found yourself on specific issues where the, to take one, so we were just talking about the environment and, you know, and nuclear, the prospect of nuclear war. There are religious ideas that seemingly perfectly inoculate people against viewing those as problems. There's no, there's no degree to which we could despoil the environment and there's no threat of nuclear cataclysm so salient that could get a fundamentalist Christian, say, who's waiting for Jesus to return and hurl sinners into a lake of fire to really worry about those problems. Because on, on some level, those are the things that have to happen as precursors to the, the glorious end of the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's you just, as a matter of biblical prophecy, you can just connect the dots and you know, things really do have to go to hell in a handbasket in order for the best thing that's ever gonna happen to finally happen. So th those are the, all the signs and, and, and wonders that they're waiting to see, right? Uh, so if you find yourself in the presence of that kind of dogmatism, where the worse things get, really the better they're getting, right. because Jesus is gonna come back and solve all our problems. Uh, don't you feel as a, just as, as a, uh, don't you feel like an, an intellectual and or ethical responsibility as a scientist to push hard on the, those specific beliefs that, that stand in the way of thinking rationally about those problems? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. In fact, it's one that, that I have had that conversation with Richard. And um, we came to an interesting point, which is I'm rarely confronted with the situation that you describe. And we suspect, at least it emerged from our conversation, because um, there's more of a, a focus, if you will, on the biological sciences as the place where a fundamentalist religious perspective will look for a point of confrontation. Yeah, with evolution, yeah. Yeah, then with, you know, somebody who's talking about vibrating strings and extra dimensions and the kind of abstract science that I focus my research attention on. So I'm not in that situation. I'm rarely, in fact, I don't think I'm ever in that situation. And that may, if I were, well, on a regular basis, I'll, I'll come along you with around, you, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. shatter you. and uh, Take you to a couple of parties. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> you know, you know. Uh, well, so, okay, so back to your uh, areas, areas of controversy in your uh, world. Hey, so for, as a consumer of physics from the outside, it seems like many people are worried that a really, I, the, the, the physics as a discipline has been more or less moribund for a, a generation. That you, ha you have string theory that this is like the most celebrated thing, in, 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 or was the most celebrated thing at a certain point, but everyone was sort of just waiting around for it to deliver the goods, and it hasn't yet, and you have a whole generation of physicists that got absorbed by this, this what was a, a kind of intellectual fashion in, in theoretical physics which may not have panned out and may never pan out. Now this is again, these are the echoes of yeah, 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 disgruntled sure. graduate students that, that one hears. Um, what, what's your view of, of the state of, of physics? Yeah, um, well, y you know, um, I think what you're describing is something that the press has picked up on in various times and it certainly has echoed in a, in a certain way throughout um, the, the public and throughout the press and so on. But um, the fact of the matter is that physics is in a, in a, theoretical physics is in a very healthy state in that there are a lot of great ideas and there's a lot of substantial progress. And when one says that a theory like string theory has not delivered the goods, mm -hmm. it feels odd for me to hear that. I understand where you're coming from, but it strikes me that it's coming from a place where you've not been within the field sufficiently deep to really see the progress that has been made. I mean, the theory on paper 
puts together gravity and quantum mechanics. The fundamental theoretical problem of 20th century physics in principle has the solution within string theory. Is it the right solution? We don't know, well, but then, that's but great then, progress. But then why is, it, why is it controversial? Why isn't everyone a, a string theorist if that, if that marriage has been consummated? Uh, they're just not good enough. <laughs> no, no, it's, um, let's, no, it's, uh, no, no, get, it, get out on Twitter. No, no, we want no, to no, spread no, this no, around. No, no, <laughs> the, the, the answer, the answer to that question, and, and, uh, please don't tweet, that was just a joke. Uh, but, uh, uh, the answer to that question is that, um, it's extraordinarily difficult to test any theory that puts gravity and quantum mechanics yeah. together. Right. Extraordinarily difficult because we don't have the technological feasibility to test the theory in the domains where it differentiates itself from conventional theories. And this is not just an issue that faces string theory. Any theory that puts gravity and quantum mechanics together is going to face this dilemma. So if we were able to build an accelerator as big as the galaxy, then we'd be able to test these ideas. That's tough to do in this funding environment. Yes, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so that's really the issue. The issue is that on paper, there are features of the theory that are enormously attractive, but we can't test them. Moreover, theorists like myself will also point out, the theory itself has gone into some directions that raise questions, interesting questions. A theory that predicts other universes as a possible intrinsic quality of the theory, you got to take a step back and ask yourself, does that make logical sense? Is that a theory that we're willing to take seriously? And, you know, after studying these questions intently for a long period of time, my answer is that, yes, these are worthy of our attention, that these theories may be taking us into the right direction. Uh, do we know that they're right? No. The only thing that will ever establish that they're correct and end the controversy would be to make a prediction and we go out and measure it. And that is the gold standard, and that's something that we've not been able to achieve. Mm. The theory is in many ways in its early stages, even 30, 40 years later. These are difficult questions. So that's the answer, why it's controversial. It's not made a testable prediction. But the theory continues to make substantial progress on understanding the nature of space and time, the nature of black holes. The theory's been able to embrace effectively all of the discoveries of the past. All of them naturally fit within the structure of strength. You don't have to wipe out the past. It embraces the past. These qualities make the theory enormously attractive and compelling. Again, it's not yet been tested. So it hasn't made any prediction analogous to the kinds that, that Einstein's relativity made that were not a matter of, of having to build some yes. apparatus with insane energies, but just you know, looking up at, at the, the bending of, of starlight. Has there been anything like that with string theory that has Absolutely been not. No. And, and that's, I mean, you know, it's funny I, that you bring that up. You know, I had a high school student many years ago who did a science talent search project, you know, this competition in the United States, where they calculated, this woman calculated the corrections to the bending of starlight by the sun that come out of string theory. Mm. Like, so that's what Einstein did, and right. maybe string theory modifies the prediction. And, and you know, it, it was a thought experiment. I roughly knew what the answer would be, and the answer that she got from calculation turned out to be about the same. It was about one part in like 10 to the 90. Yeah, that's, that's hard. So, so yeah, so, you know, it's, a, it's, it's something that you're not going to be able to measure. It's too small. Yeah, aren't there fewer... 10 to the 88, yeah. Yeah, fewer particles in the entire mind. universe, yes, right, yes. okay, yes. Uh, so, so you, you mentioned m multiple universes. Uh, I think there, there, are there are at least a few different ways in which there might be multiple universes. Yeah. Or way, but the, the, there is a many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics that I think to the... I think to, to the alarm of most people who hear about this uh, is very well subscribed among physicists. Right now, where do you come out? You might want to summarize what, why one would be tempted to believe in, in multiple universes. Yeah. But these are, these are universes wherein you know, trillions upon trillions of nearly identical copies of ourselves are having nearly identical conversations, you know, just w w but, but with every different variation of what's possible. So essentially, everything that can possibly happen 
happened somewhere. So there was a, there was there's a, if it's compatible with, with the laws of physics. Law. Yeah. yeah. Right. So there was there is a universe. If you subscribe to this theory, uh, there is a universe in which we had this conversation and then you know took our clothes off in the middle of it, right? <laughs> uh, for reasons that presumably made sense in that universe. Wait, wait. Let me calculate. Uh, Not compatible yeah. with laws of physics. Yes. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This this will not happen in this universe. Rest assured. Uh, but. This is, this is actually believed, right? Now, this, this on its face, to me, is the least believable thing on offer. Right? Yeah. And yet this is, this is not only yeah. subscribed but to, by someone, this is, this is actually just plain vanilla quantum mechanics now. Uh, I wouldn't go that far, no. But I think, there, there's like great for, controversy on this. I mean, David Deutsch, who you mentioned, is one of right. the proponents of this way of thinking about quantum mechanics, but I would not call it the vanilla interpretation of quantum but, mechanics. But I think if you poll people at a physics conference, you get something it's like changed. 30 percent or something that, that believe this. I don't know if 30 percent I would call vanilla, but um, y you know, it changes over time. And, and uh, I, I, first, maybe it's worth quickly saying what it is, yeah. and then I can give you my yeah. perspective it. on it. So, so, so quantum mechanics broke with the past by saying that whereas Newton in classical physics taught us that you can, given the state of the world now, predict how it will be five minutes later or a million years later using the equations of motion to evolve it forward in time, quantum theory came along and said that's the wrong way of thinking about things. If you know everything that you can know about the universe right now, the best you can do is predict the probability, the likelihood that you get one or another outcome when you run the equations forward an hour or 100 million years into the future. Now that sets up an interesting situation because, for instance, if the law says that there's a 50% chance that the electron is here and 50% chance that it's over here, right? When you go to measure the electron, you don't find sort of half of it here and half of it here you always find one whole electron either here or here. So the question is, if you find the electron in my left hand, what happened to the possibility of it being in my right hand? Right. You might say, well, that just goes away. The problem is just goes away is incompatible with the mathematics. The most straightforward reading of the equation suggests, if you just use the most straightforward interpretation that's right there, the equation suggests that there's actually one universe where indeed you do find it in my left hand, and there's another universe where you find it in my right hand, and therefore there's a copy of me in that universe with two hands, right. thinking that there's only one unique outcome, but there are two of me in distinct universes under that same illusion, that there's only one universe, but the God's eye view, if you don't mind me using that metaphor, is that there are, <laughs> there are, there are, this universe. There, there are many universes out there, and basically anything that's allowed by the laws of quantum physics is represented in this menagerie of universes. Now, if you ask me, do I subscribe to this way of thinking about quantum mechanics, my answer is no. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, um, I'm not saying that it's wrong, I'm saying that we're not at the point yet where we can answer that question. Because there's a gaping hole in the structure of quantum mechanics that maybe doesn't get enough air time. Quantum mechanics, in my view, and many others, but this is not universal, is not a complete subject. We're missing a solution to the so-called quantum measurement problem, which simply is the question, when you measure the position of a particle like an electron, how do you go from this weird, fuzzy mixture of multiple possibilities? It's over here and it's over here, and there's some kind of fuzzy mixture of the two. How do you go from that fuzzy probabilistic description in the equations to the single definite reality that emerges when you actually undertake the observation. Right. How do you go from fuzziness to definite reality? And this is a question that we do not know the answer to. And since clearly in thinking about where the possibilities go, the act of measurement or observation is intrinsic to the very question that we're talking about, until we answer that question, we can't really come to a conclusion on what the right way of thinking about quantum mechanics is. Do, do you think we're far enough along that we can conclude that there is no answer that goes down easily with respect to our intuitions? That, no. That, that any answer is going to seem crazy? No, no I don't think so. Okay. Uh, there is a version of quantum mechanics that's sort of the dark horse version of the theory due to somebody named David Bohm. No. No. Also, Louis de Broglie had the same idea a couple decades earlier. And this version of quantum mechanics that's virtually never taught 
never spoken about in public, right. has the quality that particles still go along trajectories, right? The, the new idea of quantum mechanics is, in the traditional way that one talks about it, is particles don't move on trajectories. It's just those nebulous waves that are evolving in some weird quantum space called Hilbert space, not even the space that we live in. That's the reality that's being described by the equations. But David, David uh, Bohm came along and said, no, there's a version of this theory in which particles still go along definite trajectories. Right. And, and that's closer to our intuition about how the world works. So this way of thinking about quantum mechanics were to bear fruit, if that's the right way of doing it, it will be somewhat closer to our intuition than the version that we currently talk about. Well, remind me, what, what do you, you, I still recall you have to sacrifice something that we're attached to as a matter of common sense with Bohm. You have, you have to sacrifice locality, right? I mean, it's, it's a, it's a non-local. That's theory. right. So, so it has the weird property that, you know, you do something over here and it affects something over here instantaneously. Yeah, and over and here it can be in Andromeda. It could be in yeah. the other side right. of the universe. Yeah. Now, uh, you say, as you rightly do, we're giving something up. And therefore, that suggests that there are other versions of quantum mechanics where you don't have to give that up. But the fact of the matter is, even in the most straightforward version of quantum mechanics that we teach to our students all the time, there is a non-local quality already. It's called entanglement. Yeah. It's the Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen contribution in 1935, which showed that if you have a particle over here and a particle over here, you do a measurement over here, measurement, right? So again, this unknown quality called quantum measurement comes into the story. But you do a measurement over here and it affects the particle over here. This is what Einstein called spooky. Spooky action at a distance. You do something here and it affects something over there. But that's within the standard formulation of quantum mechanics as well. In this Bohmian version, it's made more explicit. It's more in your face. Right, it's right there in the math. You don't have to do analysis to find it. But in a sense, you're not giving something up because you've already given it up with quantum mechanics. Right. Now, it's very um, fashionable in new age circles to find solace in one interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is usually described as the Copenhagen interpretation, which privileges this measurement moment of, of the, the, the role of consciousness in determining the nature of reality. And Einstein famously said, you know, I, 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 do, do you really think that the moon doesn't exist unless I'm looking at it as a way of disparaging this, this uh, view? My sense from talking to physicists of late is that, that interpretations of QM that privilege the role of consciousness are less and less fashionable to the point of being more or less retired now. Is that, is that actually where it, where it is? And, and do you... What do you think about consciousness as, as a part of this puzzle? Well, uh, it's, it's a very hard question because you can't ever get out of your head, right? I mean, if you imagine a measurement being undertaken not by a conscious being, but by a computer or some mechanical device, you'd say, well, there's no conscious quality involved and therefore consciousness can't play a role in the process, you still need to go over and look at the device to see whether it's accomplished what you set it out to do. So it's very hard to ever get outside of the framework in which a conscious being is brought in at some point in the quantum mechanical story. And that's what makes it hard to excise it fully. However, having said that, it, there's no reason that we can possibly see where consciousness plays a fundamental role in the quantum unfolding, right? I mean, you write down the basic equations and they apply to individual particles and whether those individual particles are grouped together in some amorphous mass or into this nicely organized structure that allows some kind of internal processing to take place, it doesn't seem to matter to the equations. That's an add-on. And therefore, it doesn't seem that consciousness is, is vital to the story. So um, I don't think so. I don't think consciousness is essential. And I would just underscore one point. We talk about interpretations of quantum mechanics, as if quantum mechanics exists, and we're just sort of sitting back trying to say, what do we make of it? That's not the situation. Yeah. These so-called different interpretations 
are attempting to resolve this unsolved problem of quantum measurement. And that's a real issue. And therefore, it can well be the case that these aren't just different interpretations, they're different theories. And if we understand them well enough, and we finally have a solution to the measurement problem, we might find that it's not that we were struggling with interpretations, we were struggling with actually giving birth to the full theory itself. Mm. And I suspect that that's where things will ultimately turn out. Right, right. Well, I know we have to uh, go to questions soon. I just, I just have one more question I want to ask you before we do, but perhaps if that needs to be prepared at any, uh, with mics, um, we should do that. Uh, but what is the status of the, the concept of time in physics now? I mean, we, you know, most of us know that space and time got married with, with Einstein, and so that you, we speak of, of space-time as opposed to time on its own, but uh, I mean, t time, time is a, you know, both space and time are uh, intuitions we have. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of, our nervous system is sectioning reality in such a way as to naturally produce these concepts for us. And, there's every reason to believe now, it sounds that, like, that our common sense about space and time is not, in fact, what they are as a matter of physical reality. Uh, but there are concepts in physics, like the concept of a block universe, right, that suggests that we're, we're radically at odds with, with what reality is, that it, it, under some construal, the future exists just as much as, as the present, uh, and, the, and as does the past. And so where, what, can you give us a kind of a potted uh, view of, of what time is uh, from the point of view of physics today? <laughs> yes. And, and as a matter of time, you have two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so, before Einstein came on the scene, everybody had the intuitive notion of time, and that was the very notion of time that was in the equations of physics that, that Newton gave us. And when Einstein came along, he shattered that perspective, first in 1905, I think as many are familiar, by showing that objects in motion will find that their clocks do not tick off time at the same rate. Right. That's crazy, right? We used to think there is a time that we're all relentlessly moving forward within, second after second, and if you're in relative motion, your clocks won't tick off time at the same rate. That's crazy. Then and, and that's been also experimentally established. That's not just a matter of the theory. We, we've sent clocks you know, around the world in airplanes, and, and our, our GPS relies on, on, on taking that into account and all of that. Absolutely right. And we've got particles and accelerators that are living much longer than they would if they were sitting on a table because their clock is taking off time more slowly. Right. So this is beyond doubt. Then 1915, Einstein gives us general relativity, and we learn that it's not just motion that affects the passage of time, it's also gravity affects the passage of time. Mm. So if you're near a strong gravitational source, time will tick off far more slowly than it is if you're far away from that gravitational source, that gravitational potential. Again, that's kind of a crazy idea, right? You hang out near the edge of a black hole and time for you elapses more slowly than for somebody who is far away. Now these are all giving us insights into strange and unexpected features about the nature of time and also space, which is melded together, as you indicated. But the deeper question is the one that you asked toward the end, which is, is time and space, are these fundamental structures in reality, or do we impose them on reality in order to organize our inner perception? And it's a very hard question. I don't know the answer to it, but I will say this. One of the features of string theory in the last few years, some really remarkable work, has gone a really giant step forward towards showing that space and time may not be fundamental structures. They may emerge from more basic ingredients that naturally arise in string theory. So, you know, this is... Emergence, of course, is a familiar idea in many subjects. You know, we all know what temperature means. We know when things are hot, when they're cold. But then you dig deeper, and we know that temperature actually is a reflection of how quickly molecules and atoms are moving. 
Something's hot when the average motion is fast. Something's cold when the average motion is slower. So that gives us a deeper understanding of what temperature is in terms of more fundamental entities. Yeah. We've now taken a step toward that kind of progression for space and time. There's work in string theory that shows that space may actually be stitched together by the threads of the quantum entanglement that we were describing before, that non-local quality of quantum mechanics. We've been able to do calculations within string theory, in essence, where we're able to cut the threads that are keeping the fabric of space together. Nothing to worry about, just mathematics. <laughs> but you know, we, we cut these threads, and we're able to see that what remains are sort of isolated points that no longer stitch together in the manner of our familiar conception of what space is. So this, to me, is, is probably the next revolution. If you ask me what the next revolution is, it's going to be a way of thinking about physics in which space and time are not put in at the get-go into the equations, mm. but rather emerge later on when certain environmental conditions are met, and when they are met, space and time as we intuitively know them will emerge, but when those conditions are not met, there can be realms of the universe in which there is no conventional notion of space and no conventional notion of time. Mm. Right. Well. Unfortunately, on this stage, there's a very conventional notion of time. Uh, so uh, we would love to get your questions, and we'd love the house lights to change so that we can see some of you. Right. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we will just uh, go left and right here. Um, Uh, we'll start over here. Thank you. Yeah. And just just to remind everybody, questions questions often end in a high rising tone. So if you can achieve that, you're you're good. Uh, thank you. Hi, I just want to say thank you for the talk. Okay, I found it very interesting, and uh, thank you to you both for coming to Toronto. Oh, um, I think <laughs> fine. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my question kind of loosely relates to kind of what you guys talked about in the beginning, and there was a scientist, Sam, you talked about, who you said you don't know why he came to this conclusion, but there was oh, no David way, Deutsch, yeah, yeah it's, there's no way to conceivably think of AI or an alien species that um, humans can't comprehend. I, my question kind of loosely relates to that, and I kind of have to preface it with um, a quick explanation of experiments, how I think about it in my head. Um, I don't really know what the experiment is called, but it's like the red dot experiment where a scientist would put a red dot on different animals' forehead and yeah, put a mirror yeah, in front of them. Yeah, self-recognition. Yeah, yeah, and kind of rank their level of intelligence or their level of um, capacity of consciousness. Yeah. And I was wondering if maybe both of you have an opinion on this, whether humans kind of have an analogous kind of red dot point where there becomes a problem or an issue where just our biology or our, our capacity of knowledge or, or consciousness, you know, we might look at the answer of the problem right in the face and just not be able to see it. Like, it's right there, but yeah. we just can't comprehend yeah, it yeah. within our... Um, so I guess for both of you, kind of is appropriate because, Sam, you're deep, your primary concern is consciousness and level of thought. And Brian, I, I assume that you and your colleagues are probably going to be at the forefront butting heads with these problems. Um, so I guess my question is, do you guys think that there's a limit or can humans just continually expand basically yeah, forever? Yeah, in terms of well, it's an interesting analogy that I, I haven't really uh, thought of before. But so, so just to remind you all of what that is, there's this mirror self-recognition test that has been done on various species of animals. And most species, no matter how smart they appear in other ways, if you put them in front of a mirror, they don't warm up to the realization that that's them in the glass. They relate to that, that other species as a, that, that, that image as another member of their species. Uh, so, and, and embarrassment ensues. Uh, <laughs> but there are certain species that, that very few, that can gradually recognize that, that you know, the, the, based on their own movements, that the, you know, the, the dot is on their heads. Um, and 
I think we are, I was so just, it's very easy to see personally, I mean, I, I think you know, it's easy to see that one as an individual has certain limitations, certain things to which one is, is cognitively and emotionally and just dispositionally closed, right? And certain games you can't play or, or you certainly can't play uh, in any, under any kind of time horizon that make it pragmatic for you to attempt to play those games, right? So like if you put, put in a room with the, the Martians for long, like how long does the conversation have to go on to fully explore your cognitive limits? Well, you know, for many of us, not all that long, right? And then the question is how, you know, but, but it, my, my sense is that, well, it would be, this is another question I could ask you too that fits in here. If you could nominate one member of our species, past or present, who just as a, as a brain that would be best suited to, to explore the limits of human cognitive horizons in the presence of superintelligent aliens, who would, you, who would you put in that room to just say, okay, this is humanity, this is the, the best we've got in, in terms of dialogue with Sam the species? Harris. I know, Justin Bieber. No, it, yeah, um, no, no. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, and I think part of the answer to that but well, well, let me just give you a candidate. So it's either John von Neumann or it's Isaac Newton. You can give them all the modern understanding. Just like a, just a brain to just, just put there. I guess I would be uncomfortable because they're really smart at certain things. Yeah. But like, why not Shakespeare or Freud? I mean, there's just well, so many different ways of, of engaging reality. I can, I can reality. tell you why not Freud, but... What's that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I stopped right. myself halfway yeah. through. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but interesting, you knew where I was going with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, um, I think intelligence comes in, in a, a wide variety of different forms. And uh, it, it could be, as you're suggesting, that the answer's right in front of us and we don't see it. I, I, I suspect that's a real possibility. But I'll give you one data point. And I'm not sure how relevant it is, but at least it gives me some sense of optimism. When I was a graduate student a long time ago, it seemed like the amount of material that you needed to learn in order to even begin to do your research for the degree, the doctoral degree, was like incredible, right? I mean, so how are you gonna study all this and then have time left to do the project, but yet somehow we were able to do it. And now, you know, 35 years later, whatever it is, with all of the progress that's been made, I mean, the kids that come into string theory, they have to learn everything that I had to learn back then, and they have to learn the past 35 years of it too, and yet they still have to be done in the same number of years. Yeah. And somehow they're able to do it. So, so it feels to me that... And they still have Instagram accounts to tend to. <laughs> that, that's the amazing thing, and, and Fortnite. You know, they still play Fortnite, <laughs> you know. Um, so. So it strikes me that there's some way that we're able to adapt to the ever greater volume of, of information and knowledge that we need in order to make progress. So I guess what I'm saying is, the fact that we've not hit that wall gives me hope that we're pretty good, we're pretty flexible. But could it be, logically speaking, that there is a wall and all that we're looking for is just an inch beyond that wall and we can't quite see through it? Yeah. That was kind of more what I was, not necessarily an individual, single human that represents the best, but more like, you know, 200 years ago in terms of evolutionary time, we're pretty much the same, but drastically yeah. different. Like, will that just continue? Will we eventually be the green-headed aliens coming down with super magical technology, or will we get to a point where the well, entire Well, as, as long as we keep going, I mean, I, th I yeah. think it's, the leverage is Can culture. I mean, yeah. we, we, we keep, we keep, Porting our not our, all the gains into culture, and then there's a kind of a chunking. I mean, this this explains how each new wave of graduate students can kind of recapitulate the history of, of intellectual progress in physics in their own lifetime, and you know, know more about physics than Einstein did, and then and then keep going. Um, it's uh, anyway interesting question over here. Thank you. Um, you're probably both aware of, of Niels Bohr's position. Physics is to be regarded not so much as the study of something a priori given, 
but rather as the development of methods of ordering and surveying human experience. So it's right. less finding the photon that's actually there and, and more um, making sense of those lines as a picture of an old woman or a young woman. Yeah. What's, what's your take on, on Bohr's position? Well, I think we, we actually, in deference to time, I'll say we, we sort of covered that in talking about the Copenhagen interpretation of, of physics. I mean, it was, he was the, the originator of that interpretation. And, uh, you know, the, the, the sense at that point, when, when, when quantum mechanics was first being born, there was a very strong sense that the universe was more mind-like than matter-like based on that view of things. And, you know, feel free to correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here, but I feel like the conversation at the very least has, has widened and moved on, and it, we're not quite there where, with Bohr's take on it. Yeah, the one thing I would add to that is, you know, Bohr, Bohr had a view of the world which is aligning with what you're saying is, ultimately, science is about explaining observations and data. It's not about peeling back the curtain and seeing the fundamental reality. And I think Bohr was forced into that position by virtue of the fact that he couldn't peel back the curtain. And quantum mechanics was working, and yet he was unable to tell us what it was telling us about the true nature of reality. So he said, don't worry about the true nature. of That's not what physics is about. And I think it's a very limited way of looking at science. I'm not so interested in being able to only predict the results of experiments. I like that. That's the gold standard. But in the end of the day, when I'm on my deathbed, I hope that I have some deeper understanding of what's reality, of what's behind that curtain. And if all that we're doing is being better able at predicting results of experiments to further decimal places down the line, I'd rather be doing something else. Over here. Hi, thank you both for coming. My question is for Sam. Uh, earlier in the talk, you asked Dr. Green about what issues keep him up at night. And aside from nuclear proliferation, I was wondering if you could share with us your answer for the same. Uh, well, largely it is kind of the, the meta issue mm. of our reliable failure to make sense to one another and have conversations that productively, that lead to, to, to the solution of problems in any kind of direct way. You know, so the fact that we have political systems that can't function over a long time horizon. You know, we've got this you know, four-year election cycle, presidentially, to, to worry about, and therefore it's impossible to have a 40-year a plan about anything, right? And, and we, have, and we, we, have, we have problems whose time horizon is long or longish, and we have, we have problems that are global in nature so the, by definition, we can't solve these individually as, as nation states, and we can't solve these by fixating on the, the incentives of a, you know, a four-year election cycle. And in the midst of all that, we have a level of, of polarization, whether it's you know, political or, or you know, it's ideological across the board. It's, it's religious. It's, I mean, there, there are many things that contaminate our conversation with one another, which make it important virtually impossible to make sense long enough and, and productively enough to get all of us to converge on, I mean, even just even to recognize what the problems are, much less the, the, how to solve them. So um, I, I just think that the, I think conversation is all we have, successful conversation is all we have to solve our problems together. And so when I see it just break down not only frequently and catastrophically, but reliably so. It's like you can, you can just guarantee that the conversation is going to be ineffectual, uh, given where most people are most of the time. That, that's, that's what worries me, and that's kind of the meta problem that, that subsumes all the others, whether it's climate change or, or nuclear war pr proliferation, or how do we deal, how do we deal with uh, emerging pandemics or the prospect thereof, you know, why can't we decide to make more antibiotics that we, when we know we're running out of them? Um, we just can't agree how to create systems that, that incentivize things we know we want to do or should know we want to do because we, we, can't, even, we can't even talk coherently enough about these things. So. 
Thank you. Yeah. Over here. Uh, hi. Um, hey. So uh, Sam's opening question for Dr. Green was, um, what is it that gives you uh, optimism about that uh, one can make progress, uh, um, I guess, intellectually? And your answer was that we can prove the outcomes, or we can predict the outcomes of experiments. In the most recent question, you actually said, if that's all we're doing, um, you'd rather find something else to do. Um, and during your talk, you, t you uh, said that the quantum measurement problem is the f gaping hole in the quantum, uh, quant the theory of quantum theories, or theory of quantum mechanics, and makes it almost impossible to choose between uh, those that emerge. Um, and so it seems that there's no path to a place where the thing that you, that gives you confidence that we can make progress no path exists to that state. Do you retain confidence in the endeavor? You know, I've, I've, I've never quite thought of it that way, and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kind of devastated. Uh, no, um, so, so a few things. First off, when I talk about what gives me confidence in the approach that we're following, it's the fact that we have a powerful diagnostic that tells us whether we're going in the right direction. That diagnostic is not the final reason we do what we do, but that diagnostic is, can you make a prediction? Can you test it with an observation or an experiment? And I love it as a diagnostic. I don't love it as the end game. And that's the difference between the two. Now, in terms of the, the quantum measurement problem itself, it's a very curious state of affairs because we have an algorithm called a quantum algorithm that allows us to make predictions for the result of an experiment, even though the intermediate step, we don't understand how the universe makes that intermediate step, and that's the hole that I was describing earlier. But nevertheless, the algorithm works, and that's borne out by the agreement between prediction and observation. So it's not as though we're, we're fully at sea and the boat's about to tip. We are incredibly on course, but there are vital pieces of the story that we've yet to figure out. Now, I should say, there are other physicists who would be up here and saying there is no quantum measurement problem. I mean, my good friend, um, you know, Anton Zeilinger, you know, this is, a, this is a brilliant man who doesn't just do quantum physics calculations, he actually does the experiment. So this is like the real deal, not like someone just spouts off about these ideas. He actually does the stuff. And you know, when I sit with him and talk with him, he kind of has an avuncular attitude toward me. He says, hey, you can worry about those kind of things if you want to, but you're wasting your time because there's no problem, Brian. And, and, and so that's his perspective. It works. We have an algorithm, and we can make predictions, and end of story. So, so it's just to say that there are different attitudes as to whether this is an issue, because I think there are different goals that we have as scientists. As we were saying to the uh, earlier question, some of us just want to be able to predict, some of us want to be able to enlighten. And whether that latter goal is misguided, I don't know. I don't think it is, but some in the field certainly do. Hello, my name is Brendan. I'm an intern on some of the dark matter experiments at Snow Lab, and I, I have a question for Brian. I was curious, seeing the results from many recent dark matter experiments that have searched larger energy spaces and are possibly indicating it may not exist, and that brings into question some of the predictions of supersymmetry. So I was wondering, what do you think the plan B is if that doesn't work out? Well, just 30 seconds on the background, and everybody I think knows that since the 1930s there's been increasing evidence that there should be more stuff out there than we see, dark stuff, because we need something to give rise to an additional gravitational tug responsible for the motions of stars and galaxies that we observe. So for a long time now we've been trying to go out and find this dark stuff. We assume that it's raining down on Earth, 
We don't see it, but we build detectors in hopes that we will. Can you spell out what dark means in this context? This dark solely means that it doesn't give off light. Right. And that's really all that it is. So it's, uh, many of the proposals involve particles that, uh, as the questioner asked, some of them are exotic species of particles that come out of theories like string theory or more generally supersymmetry. And we had hoped and the hope is not dead, that these experiments would capture one of these dark particles, particles that don't give off light, that don't interact with the electromagnetic force. That's right. a more precise way of saying it. Uh, but we've come up empty-handed for a long time. So what's the answer to this? There are a number of answers. Number one, it could be that we just got to keep on looking and we'll find it. I think that's the, the bread and butter answer that many people still have. More exotic answer is that perhaps there is no dark matter at all, and maybe it's our understanding of the force of gravity that needs to be modified. And that's why things are moving in a way that doesn't comport with our previous understanding of gravity, and that motivated the introduction of this new stuff to make up the difference, but maybe it's gravity that's not doing what we think it should be doing. Uh, and a third possibility, which is an elaboration of that, is there are exotic ideas that have emerged from string theory, so-called holographic ideas. It'd be a bit involved to explain it in any detail, but some of those ideas suggest that there's no need for dark matter at all, that the natural solution to the mismatch between observation and prediction is resolved in these more exotic approaches to understanding the force of gravity. So those are two and a half, roughly three, possible plan B's. Thank you very much. Hi there. I'm Vlad, and this question is for Sam, but I'd love to hear Brian's thoughts as well. Um, Sam, you see our efforts to make moral progress as us navigating the landscape of possible states of consciousness, and the way to navigate that space is uh, through science. Uh, I generally agree with this, but I think that there are certain categories of navigation problems to which science cannot provide an objective answer due to the fact that there are many types of beneficial mental states that are qualitatively different from each other and not readily comparable. So for example, mm. loving another person, or the joy of working to create something, or mindfulness, helping others, etc. Right. And it may be the case that achieving a peak in one area, let's say intense meditation or mindfulness, may necessitate suffering in another area, let's say the love that comes from close personal relationships. So my question is, how can we ever determine which is more important? How can science help us navigate when realizing one beneficial conscious state is in conflict with realizing another beneficial but qualitatively different conscious right. state? And, and you want me to weigh in on this too? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can say as much as I said about dark matter. <laughs> uh, well, so there's a couple of intuitions there that I would just want to push on. One is the, the idea that not being able to answer those questions uh, is a problem for, the, for the, the claim that there is an answer to those questions. So, so this is, in my book, The Moral Landscape, I, I differentiated answers in practice from answers in principle. There, we know there are, there are many facts of the matter for which there, there are answers in principle and trivially easy answers in principle, just, just integer-based answers. You know, like how many grains of sand are there on Earth, right? You know, as long as we define grain of sand clearly enough, you know, that is an integer answer. Um, and yet we know we'll never have access to that information, and it probably just changed anyway, right? So, uh, uh, you know, or even simpler, you know, how many, the, the example I've often used is, you know, how many birds are in flight over the surface of the Earth at this moment, right? Well, it just changed, and we know we're never going to get the data. So, but there was, there was an answer to that question. Uh, there are other kinds of questions where there, there are no clear answers, but there's, there are ranges of answers. There's kind of a blurry, you know, haze around the right answer. Uh, and, it's, and some of these are just norms of you know, just how we run society. It's like, well, what's the right age to give someone a driver's license? Well, you know, when I was 15 and a half, I thought, you know, 16 was, was probably a little too late. Uh, now, when I drive and I look over and I see a 16-year-old behind the wheel of a 4,000-pound automobile, I think that looks insane to me, right? 
So if self-driving cars can't come soon enough. But, <laughs> but what is the, what's the right answer? Well, given all things considered, like so, and it's, a, it's an all things considered situation where we, we know we can never do this perfectly. We know that some 16-year-olds are really not up to it, but we have to draw the line somewhere. Wherever we draw the line, it's going to be arbitrary. 16 is arbitrary. 16 and a half is ar arbitrary. 18 would be arbitrary. And, y and there's, and yet it's, we know there are wrong answers. We know that six months is definitely the wrong answer, right? <laughs> so if you shift the window of consideration there, so you're just, you're not capturing anything we care about. If you move it to, to 16, well, you're, you know, not, if we moved it to 25, you know, fewer people would die. There's no question, right? But we have other concerns beyond body count. We have, you know, mothers and fathers who are just sick of driving their kids to school every day, right? <laughs> so what's that worth? And we, 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 we play around with this, and we know we're never going to do the math sufficiently so that we know, to, you know, down to our toes, that we've got it perfectly right, right? But it doesn't mean that there aren't better and worse answers in that space. We know there are worse answers. You know, six months you know, just gets you absolutely nowhere, and 100 also doesn't work, right? So uh, the answer is somewhere along this continuum. And, and for many things in life, we have to be satisfied with that. Now, I think we'll, we, we will be less and less satisfied the more we can get our hands on really good data and the more our technology allows us to, to use that data in ways. And I think, that, and I think this will be surprising. So, I mean, just, I mean, this, is, this is true in medicine in many ways. It's like, like when there's nothing to do about a condition, Right, there is no cure, there's no understanding of its basic biology, and yet people are suffering mightily. You know, it's like polio, right? People are, are it, was, it used to be a common feature of life, even in the most uh, affluent areas, that people would, would be hobbled and killed by polio, right? Now, we've lost sight of that horror because we have a, we have a, a vaccine for polio, and have had it you know, for as long as, as most of us have been alive. Um, now, preventing polio is a trivially easy thing to do, and if you, if you decided, I mean, those, the people who are, you know, against vaccines across the board or, or so worried about the possibility that they have some other downside or who are kind of preventing uh, their kids from, from getting vaccinated, um, you know, in a very local area, it may not cause a problem for them or the people around them, but if enough people do it, we'll be back to the days of polio, right? And so that, so like, that is clearly no place worth going, right? And it becomes, you know, you, you move from an environment in which you have this devastating thing for which there's nothing to do and, and you just gotta sort of pray it doesn't happen to you to it's a trivially easy solve and you're irresponsible if you don't do it, right? And, and, and those, we will continually be buffeted around by those kinds of changes based on knowledge and, and, and changes in technology. Uh, but I, the, my main r resistance to the, to the question is the idea that a lack of answers in practice means that there are no answers in principle, uh, and, and that a blurry boundary around the right answer uh, means that the difference between better and worse, and even much, much better and much, much worse, uh, goes out the window. I think, that's, I think we, we still have that, no matter how dimly we understand our situation on any of these things. So, yeah, I hope that made sense. I mean, you know, let me just, uh, yeah, go for it. again, the only thought that occurs to me, and uh, I may not be fully appreciating the nuance of the question, so apologies, but one of the things that we certainly teach to our students you know, standard physics issue with students is um, it's critical to pose a well-formed question. And a well-formed research question is one that's not over-determined, not under-determined, but it's one that has an answer. And that's a very hard step to get to, to properly frame a question so that there is a procedure by which an answer can emerge because the system is not underdetermined, it's not overdetermined, it's not self-contradictory, and there is a unique answer to be found. And, and the issues that you're describing are ones that typically are underdetermined. 
So I'm a little bit confused when you say, you know, the answer is somewhere between here and here. What do you mean by the answer? Well, I mean, the, it's an in, underdetermined question. In this case, right? well, you know, what should be the driving age? No, no, I understand right. the question, yeah. but it's an underdetermined question. There is no right answer to it based on the, it's not a well-posed question. I mean, you can make decisions, like you say, and various people will come up with different propositions for what the good policy should be, but there is no the answer in the sense that there's, you know, there is an electron magnetic moment, right? There is a the answer in that situation because it's a question that's posed in a specific way. But, the, so, but there is a, a, gradient, a gradient, and if you go far enough in one direction, Absolutely. You, you can feel yourself getting you know, colder, 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 colder. Totally got that. And then you go back warmer, warmer, warmer. Totally warmer. got right. it. So, but that doesn't yeah. mean that there is a the answer. Yeah, no, no, so the, in those cases, any answer within a certain boundary may just seem arbitrary, because it will be arbitrary. You, don't have, you can't specify the, the right answer. I agree. Yeah. Okay. But. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name's Daniel. Um, I was wondering if I could get uh, both of your thoughts on the role of the social stigma, the societal stigma against being wrong, uh, the, the role that that plays in political, philosophical, even, and even scientific discourse, and assuming that that role is negative and substantial, what can we do on a, both a personal and societal level to mitigate and combat that stigma? Hmm. Yeah, good question. I, I, mean, I would add to that, and I'll pitch it to you first. The, there's a stigma around saying you don't know something, and, and, and there's, a, there's a asymmetry here. So in science, there, there's very little stigma around this. In fact, f people, d scientists defensively say they don't know all the time so as not to embarrass themselves in front of people who know more than, than they do uh, at a conference. So, but but, if, but if, you put a if you put a scientist on television and get him or her talking about global warming or whatever it is, and they start issuing the responsible scientific caveats about, well, we're not, you know, I'm not an expert on this or I don't know that, that doesn't translate well into, you know, popular journalist, the, the journalistic consumption of, of, of information. And it's, if you put that person up against some yeah. Bible-thumping blowhard who knows everything, <laughs> Uh, they lose. So, so totally get it. Yeah. And, and, and that's why there is not a single uh, video of me, and I say this with 100% confidence, because I have never been on television talking about something that I did not feel expert in. Right. I'm not interested. I get all sorts of calls to talk about things like the climate and features of that sort, and I don't do it. Why? For exactly the reason that you're saying. Um, I am comfortable saying I don't know, but that's not the place to be saying it. Right. Um, so, to your question, um, you know, uh, it is the case, as Sam is saying, that uh, we recognize, certainly as theoretical physicists, that most of what we do in our life will be wrong. <laughs> not because we made a mistake. Sometimes we will make a mistake. That's the hard time when that happens. But it'll be wrong in the sense that it will be irrelevant. Nature won't take any interest in the direction that our research took us, so whatever we published will just rot away in some journal someplace. And, uh, and that's true for the vast majority of what we will do, and to be a theoretical physicist, to come to terms with that early on. And um, so we're very comfortable with being wrong in that sense. Um, and I think that's a very valuable lesson, and it is a good one to have, and it does allow us freedom because we're not constantly worried, well, if I go that direction, I'll be wrong. Go no, we just go. And that allows us to have unexpected eureka moments that change everything. But that's as a community, the individual will go down many blind alleys, and that's just how it is. Mm. Well, well, how do you experience the, this larger phenomenon, which is related, of people having a, a kind of confirmation bias and a sunk cost bias that keeps them wedded to a theory that is almost certainly wrong, for which there's you know, good evidence to, to believe that you know, they, they wouldn't come to it that way now, and you have, it absorbs decades or, or at least years of, of their time. Uh, I've never seen that happen. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, right. So, 
But the, what, what's, what's often celebrated in science is that that happens less in science than anywhere else. Like in science, you win points even for proving yourself wrong or for, yeah. or for disavowing the thing that yeah. made you famous last decade because it, there's, there's now new data. Well, and hopefully when, you're the one that finds the problem with it. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but, you know, I, I think we have confidence that we're part of a community that's incredibly skeptical, that's always investigating itself. Any idea that's put forward, the rest of the community takes a sledgehammer and starts to smash on it, trying to break it. And so we feel confident that if it doesn't break, it's worthy. It's worthy of further attention and further study. So from that perspective, it's so rare for an idea to sort of hang out there and the community says it's okay and, and tries to smash the cancer and it's completely irrelevant, completely wrong, we've all been deluded. It's such a rare phenomenon. So I believe it's really the fact that we're part of this community that's self-policing. It, it doesn't need something from the outside to come in and pass judgment. It's an internal self-correcting mechanism that allows it to make progress. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I just my name's Mike. Uh, hi, Brian and Sam. Uh, I'm very appreciative that you guys are here and very thankful that we had uh, such a privilege to hear you talk about such high-level topics. Oh, thanks for coming. Um, I have a question that pertains in part to both of you, and you'll each have your own area of expertise to maybe give some input on it. Um, you didn't really get to talking about uh, different interpretations of, 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 like, for example, the many worlds theory that you talked about. I know that, Brian, you talk a lot about brain theory and that you know, spatially distributed universes where there could be copies of us, potentially. Um, so the, the part for you would be, um, which is the horse you're betting on in terms of if we were to ever be able to maybe prove that, um, whether it's the many worlds interpretation or uh, through brain theory, that we could indeed prove that there are copies of ourselves or multiple universes uh, and, and, and one day um, prove this fact. And then if we could, to Sam, um, would that be enough fodder to you know, write QED on the blackboard and say that all religious dogma kind of goes out the window since we would have infinite Jesus Christ and infinite you know, deities in each of these universes and uh, there can only be one true one according to the dogma. So would that maybe be enough that you could just yeah. slam it on well, a table and walk out? Uh, unfortunately, in some of those universes there are, well this, this brings us to the other thing we didn't talk about, the, the simulation <laughs> argument, the idea that we might be living in a simulation. And, uh, I mean, the concern there is that we could be living in a simulation run by, you know, the Mormons of the future, where Mor Mormonism is true in this simulation. Uh, and there's a similar problem in the, the many worlds interpretation, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, but if, ev if absolutely everything compatible with the laws of physics happens in these universes, isn't, it, isn't there some construal of, of quantum mechanics where Jesus is physically resurrected and that's not incompatible with it. I mean, there's some, there, there's some quantum spookiness that allows for things like a physical resurrection. Yeah, right? I mean, you don't even need to, to go to, to, to quantum mechanics in that incarnation. Mm. Uh, in, that, in, that, <laughs> in that version. Uh, you know, um, Everybody get ready with Twitter, because what's about to come out is, is, is going to be good. Yeah, so, so one of the puzzles of modern cosmology is that if we allow inflationary cosmology, which is the bread and butter version of the theory that people are talking about, if that's the right way of thinking about the universe, then ours would just be one of many universes, there'd be many big bangs in many realms out there. And, um, what that entails, in principle, is that if you wait long enough in a given universe, a uh, random particle motion, just random particle motion right. in a given universe, will coalesce into any physically realizable structure. Right. So, so you can so, just get Jesus appearing, or Jesus or Kim Kardashian just appearing out of the that, That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not joking about that. So we call it the Boltzmann brain problem after Ludwig Boltzmann, who died this day in 1906, mm -hmm. uh, and he was the first person to really think about the fact that our universe itself may not have uh, originated from some uh, process in the, in the distant past, but the universe may have existed 
effectively for an eternity, and just the random particle motion at one weird moment happened to coalesce into a configuration that over time then evolved into everything that we are familiar with. And that is a rare fluctuation of the particles, but his point was, if you've got an eternity, rare things will happen. It, well, it not only will happen, I mean, it, it, every, every rare thing is That's guaranteed right. to happen. That's right, so then, yeah. then we take that one step further beyond what he said, which is effectively the point that you're making, which is, in the far future, we, if the universe exists for an infinite amount of time into the far future, which these current theories suggest, then these random particle motions, sure, they could create another Big Bang, but it's even easier for them to create something less complex. Not a whole universe, but just create a brain floating in the void. Right. So it could be that in the far future, the particles come together and they create a thinking brain that sort of has some thoughts. And it might think that it's here having this conversation. And that brain may just exist for a second or two and disintegrates. But if the configuration of the particles is even more special, it'll last longer and longer. And if it's even more special still, it could think it's Jesus, it could be Jesus, or it could be Kim Kardashian, it could be any of these structures. Right. So, so yes, um, I'd rather you not tweet about it per se, because it has some nuance associated with it. But yeah, that would be in our future in these various ways of thinking about cosmology. Right. And, but also not just in the future, if space were big enough, Good. You, just, yeah. you just go far enough in one direction, you're going to hit all those possibilities. Absolutely. So right? if space is infinitely big, right. which we don't know that it is, but again, in the, the most favored version of cosmology, that's a very natural outcome, that space is infinitely big. And there's an interesting thing that happens there, which is in, in any region, like our observable universe, the part that we can have interactions with, we have a lot of particles here. It's a number that you made reference to, 10 to the 80, 10 to yeah. the 88, some large number of particles in our universe. Quantum mechanics shows that there are only a finite number, a huge number, but only a finite number of configurations of those particles. Now, if space goes on infinitely far, imagine you have chunks of universe that are as big as ours, mm -hmm. populated by particles, and you ask yourself, can the particle configuration in each chunk be different? Well, if it goes on infinitely far, and there are only finitely many distinct configurations, there aren't enough distinct configurations to go around. The particle configuration have to repeat. And if they have to repeat, that means that there's a version of us out there, and there's a version of effectively anything compatible laws of physics out there, and not just out there once, out there infinitely many times. I think you just made me a Scientologist. <laughs> it's, 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 My work is done. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks. Hey, guys. Uh, great talk. Appreciate it very much. Um, all right. so. I might be a bit atopical. I'm going to ask about animal rights. I guess uh, Brian is into animal rights a bit. So my question is, what is it that's true of an animal that, if true of a human, would justify stabbing them to death for a hamburger? And if you can name such a property, something that, if true of humans, uh, would justify doing this to them, would you be able to spell out the situation in which we do it to them without sounding completely psychopathic? Just to give a quick example, we'll not waste time. Uh, if you were to say intelligence, would it be okay to murder low intelligence people? If you were to say that it's the fact that it's natural, would it be you know, okay to murder humans if that were natural, mm. et cetera? Right. And I'll just, I'll just, I'll just say, um, when we went to dinner, earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he has the moral the vegan, high ground based on dinner. Yeah. had to sit with three meat eaters eating these like big ass steaks. All right, so um, toss it to you. Well, <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the amazing thing is I, I briefly considered what to order in light of having to face this moment and then I said, fuck it. Wasn't worth it. Yeah, right, yes. No, uh, why make it easy on myself? Uh, well, so there are many, so I'm, I'm basically a, a consequentialist, which means, you know, I just think it, the, the cash value of a, a moral proposition is in the, the well-being of conscious creatures now or in the future, you know, you know, actual or possible, right? So I think there are things that can be, should be captured, they can be captured by, by consequentialism thought all the way through that aren't normally captured by it. So for instance, when you ask, uh, why 
is it, uh, you know, why can't we just kill, if we, if we find people who have the characteristics of livestock, why can't we treat them exactly like livestock, right? So that's sort of a question you just asked. Well, uh, given the nature of what we are as social primates, treating people exactly like livestock has a different consequence on us and on our, uh, our culture and on our capacity to, to live with one another than treating livestock like livestock. So it's not precisely the same problem, right? So if, if, and so, you know, and that's why cannibalism, I mean, there's, there's, there's a taboo around cannibalism that makes sense. I guess there could be some world in which we throw off this taboo and that we don't pay the kinds of consequences many of us feel we might pay, right? So you, we could just, you know, eat the, eat the, the dead uh, because they're good protein and we're not at all sentimental about their bodies once we know they they're no longer have a basis for experience, right? Uh, but in this world, at this moment, given, it, given all the moving parts, if people start eating their parents when they die, we feel differently about them, right? And, and that begins to derange a lot of many other things we care about. So you have to take all the consequences in view. Now, I, I think that it's, it's impossible to defend factory farming as it is, I mean, knowing the details. I think that's, it's just, we want to solve that problem somehow, right? Um, you know, many, and yet, I happen to think that it's not at all obvious that we can all be vegans and be healthy, right? I mean, we're, you know, we were talking, for, to give the, the full picture, we were talking about the problem of being a parent and having vegan or vegetarian kids, right? Now, I, I, my view of that is that you're running a kind of science experiment on your kids, and it's not totally clear how it's gonna come out, right? And, we, and, and when I've run that experiment on myself, it's, you know, I, beca I became anemic when I, the first time I was a vegetarian for six years. I, the, the, all kinds of things go sideways in my blood when I, the last time I did this experiment for, for a year. Uh, now, no doubt with, with more intelligence or more attention to the details, most people can solve those problems for themselves as a, a vegan or a vegetarian, but perhaps not everyone can, right? And I think there may be another solution. I mean, I, I'm hopeful that, that uh, this whole, this clean meat uh, uh, revolution that is struggling to be born will be one solution. So there's this, this company, Memphis Meats, whose CEO I had on my podcast, where they have a meatball that they have engineered out of, you know, that does not entail the death of any animal, it entails the removal of a single cell from the, the, the right animal. They grow these cells in culture, and then you have, you know, unfortunately now it's still an $18,000 meatball, but <laughs> ultimately if it could be brought to scale, it would be a meat industry that wouldn't entail the, the suffering and, and death of, of billions of animals. There's this, if, if you're, if you really are worried just about the experience of conscious creatures, there is a way of flipping this around. I have no illusions that this will convince you, a committed vegan or vegetarian, but this, you, you have to have an actual counter-argument if, if you stipulate the, what I want you to stipulate here. If it's possible to raise livestock, uh, under conditions where they are really living lives worth living, right? So that you can really have happy cows or happy ducks or chickens or pigs, uh, and it's, which is to say it would be better for those animals to have been than to not have been. These are net positive lives. Well then, that's a world in which veganism is not actually the most compassionate solution. That, that, that would be a world in which bringing those billions of creatures into existence and giving them net positive lives would be better than, than, than not, if you think well-being aggregates in some way. If you think, if, the, if you have the intuition that having a world with seven billion happy people is better than a world with two billion happy people, it's stipulating that happiness accrues in some sense, right? Um, you can run that same experiment. Now, I'm not saying we're anywhere near there with respect to our current practices, and I, you know, I would completely support every differentiation one wanted to make with respect to the ethics of treating animals well, but it's just, it's not a, Given all of the moving parts, it's not a straightforward uh, question of saying, well, 
obviously everyone should be vegan right now. Well, I would just answer by saying don't stab him for the hamburger. Yeah, Thanks, what's, guys. That, yes, uh, I mean, that, that is a, a one answer, but I think it's... it's uh, <laughs> Yeah, thanks to you both for coming. Sam, big fan on the, pod, the podcast. Um, my question is for you, actually. Um, and it has to do with AI. And when I think about your podcast, you talk to so many very intelligent intellectual people on a number of different topics. And I'm interested to know what you are most excited about. You talked about um, you know, the pessimism uh, you know, related to human intelligence and what we are all aware of. And mm -hmm. obviously AI is gonna you know, really take us to the next level, be it from you know, the, the CRISPR perspective of you know, looking at um, all of the different uh, research that's being done here at home or outwardly at uh, you know, planetary exploration. But from a standpoint, just for all of us in the room, what are you most excited about in you know, the remaining years that you're here on Earth when you think about AI and the advancements and the potential that we have? What are you most excited about? Well, I, you know, I think it's the, the most important and amazing and necessary thing when you, when you think about it going well, right? Like, we have all of these problems for which intelligence at some, across some threshold, is the only solution, right? Whether it's, you know, how to solve for certain diseases, you know, or, or stabilize our economy, or understand climate well enough, or make various scientific breakthroughs that would give us great benefit. Uh, I mean, and to think of building systems that can play all of these games that we care about and are right to care about, and which protect everything else we care about, so much better than we can that it's just, it's, it's clear they, they need to do it. I mean, that, I mean, just when you look at what's happened with some, a very simple game like chess or uh, Go, you know, I mean, they, you know, Alpha Zero, so, so we've, been, we've been playing chess for, I don't know, what was it, uh, something like a thousand years, right? And you have, this, you have the totality of human knowledge and ingenuity purposed on that very narrow task where, where people have gotten just amazingly good at this and people spend their whole lives getting, you know, we have, the, we have the smartest people spending their whole lives at this fairly simple task and getting as good as humanly possible. And then we build computer programs that, that have studied every game we have a record of and they get as good as as it seems they can possibly get on the basis of the totality of that knowledge, and they get a little bit better than people. And that's the situation that we had up until, you know, Google came up with, with AlphaGo and then AlphaZero, and AlphaZero was a program that didn't have any chess knowledge in it, right? Didn't study all of humanity's record of, of genius with chess. It just played itself for four hours and then beat the best bespoke chess computer ever made, right? Um, or played it, you know, something like 100 games and, and, you know, to a draw, you know, 28 times and, and you know, then beat it, you know, 72 other times. Uh, so you just, just imagine having that kind of breakthrough in every other area that we care about, you know, whether it's solving mathematical theorems or, you know, protein folding problems and developing new drugs, everything, right? It's, intelligence is the only game in town when you want to solve problems. And there's, there's no reason to think that it's not substrate independent, which is to say there's no reason to think that all the intelligence we care about, that, that there's every reason to think that intelligence across the board is just like chess. Right? It's just like that. we now know that computers can be much better than we will ever be at chess or at Go. Uh, and there's every reason to think that everything else we're doing on the basis of information processing is just like that. Um, I, I mean, I think you know, that's, that's an assumption, but I think, it's a, I think it's a good assumption to make. And once you make that assumption, then you just see all of the ways in which we can solve uh, just uh, problems we can't even dream of solving now. Uh, and that'll, that will be an amazing world to live in. It's also very interesting that if we get any significant piece of that wrong, we are just ushering in this, this just dystopian hellscape for ourselves, very likely, right? So, so 
And there, there are all kinds of moral problems we need to solve because we need to build our values into these intelligent systems. We can't have, you know, they have to be, cons they have to be tethered to what we want and our own notion of our own well-being. And they, and they have to be something that we can be in dialogue with so as to refine our notion of what we want and what we should want in the, in the future. I mean, that, that's the, the ultimate thing for me would be to have an intelligent system that would be a kind of oracle or a kind of genie where you could be in dialogue with it and it could sort of map out for you sort of where you are in, the, in, the, uh, in this part of the landscape of, of possible experience and where it is you might find worth going based on what's you know, possible for a, a brain like yours and a brain like yours in, in perhaps you know, very real you know, uh, mechanical dialogue or you know, electromagnetic dialogue or pharmacological dialogue with, with uh, you know, a system more intelligent than yourself. So I, mean, I think the, the life could get very, very strange and very, very wonderful. But again, there's like, there's like this tightrope walk into the strange and wonderful and off the rope is just this plunge into weirdness and that's uh, not at all you know, humanistic uh, or even compatible with, with our basic sanity. So I think it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's thrilling because it's a, re it's a problem where science and moral philosophy totally intersect, right? Like this is philosophy on a deadline, as somebody recently said. Um, that might have been Nick Bostrom. Uh, and I, I think, you know, there's a lot of problems we have to get right and even to, even to think about this stuff. And it, and it relates to the question that was just asked about, you know, the ethics of killing animals. I mean, the, the, we, we could live to see a time where there's, there's, a, there's a just as poignant an ethical question about you turning off your com computer. You know, are you committing a murder when you turn off a computer of sufficient sophistication, right? Um, or are we inadvertently building machines that can suffer, you know, and, that, and that's a, a huge problem, so. Hello, Sam. My question relates to your claim about a lack of free will. Given such partial it is true, how do we draw the line between the incompatible nature of free will with reality as we understand it versus our lack of free will and its irreconcilable nature with a functioning pragmatism? In other words, if the most evil man we can envision is simply a Darwinistic and or environmental error who happened to inherit a concoction of variances which he did not choose, how do we finally calibrate our moral scruples on an obvious contradiction between well-being and uh, responsibility? As an example, if we were to create a pill that could cure the next kid who would potentially be Charles Whitman, uh, it seems a net positive for everyone in doing so. However, if we try to run the same logic with Hitler and Saddam Hussein post-atrocities, our moral edifice seems to fall right under our feet. Granted, right. such situations are anomalous, but I would argue the same logic can be applied at a lesser degree on most criminals. So I have two questions for you. Number one, could it be that... <laughs> I love this. What, what's amazing here is what you're doing now, people really often hate, but you're doing it so well that it's just fun. So just keep going. <laughs> So to, to I'm, I'm, ask your question. I'm very nervous right now, which is why I'm trying to speak so fast. No, no, it's great. Okay. Um, number one, could it be that the pragmatic implications of a nonchalant happiest can be Hitler roaming around, uh, jeopardize society, and therein overturn his lack of responsibility for having done so in the first place? And number two, where do you draw the boundary between our ethical commitment to curing the ill and the devastating reper repercussions their misapprehensions can cause on society? Right, okay, well uh, that's a, a great question about the, the implications of dispensing with free will on our morality and on our politics and on our solving problems together. Well, so I think, I don't know where, we, we, we haven't talked about this, but I don't know if free will makes as little sense to you as it does to me. I think, I think free will is a, I, I think there's no way to think about the propagation of causes in this world that makes any deep sense of this notion of free will. And I, I think if we, we understood ourselves if you grant that, you know, nobody picks their parents, nobody picks their genes, nobody picks the environmental influences to the system that's specified by, by genes and development. Yeah, I mean, I, we were each a bag of particles governed by the laws of physics, and that's right. all there is to it. Yeah, and, and even if you added, you know, ectoplasm or immortal souls, I mean, no, nobody picks their souls, you know, or soul. Um, or even and, put quantum mechanics, the randomness of quantum mechanics is not what we mean by volitional choice. Exactly, right. So, so we're sort of on the same page, it sounds like. <laughs> so, you know. But we had to say that. Yeah. And if, if, we, if you returned our brains to precisely the state they're in at this moment, we would, 
we would make the noises that we're making in precisely the same way. No. Every time. Well, but adding randomness, I do not agree randomness with that. doesn't help. Randomness doesn't help, but we wouldn't make the same noises. We would make different noises, but we couldn't choose what noises right. we would make, okay. and that's very different. Those noises would be dictated by the, the totality of influences to the system in that moment. But you're, you're adding quantumness, or you're adding... Yes, exactly. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so this whole idea yeah. of rerunning the tape and running it forward again does not yield the same progression, but it doesn't yield the progression that we have volitional choice over. Right, got it, okay. So, so quantum mechanics doesn't... make that clear. Yeah, quantum mechanics doesn't get you, get you the freedom you think you have yes, either. Yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> So, but, but you have this additional piece where you, we have these cases where, you know, someone does something heinous, like they, I mean, there was a, uh, there was a case that uh, I talked about with um, Robert Sapolsky on my podcast that, that uh, it was in the news where some, you know, otherwise totally normal guy started getting really fixated on child pornography, right? So there, there was, you know, child pornography was found on his work computer or whatever, he got fired, and then he started doing all kinds of inappropriate things and they discovered he had a brain tumor, and the, the judge in this case didn't find the brain tumor totally exculpatory for somebody. Like, I, I, like the judge sort of split the baby and put him in jail for eight years when it could have been, you know, for the rest of his life. And, you know, R Robert and I both talked about what a bizarre miscarriage of justice that was. Uh, but it is an intuition that we all have that, that once you understand the causes of bad behavior clearly enough, once you find a brain tumor that's big enough and in just the right place, as, as was the case with Charles Whitman, uh, who you referenced, that seems exculpatory. That seems like, okay, this, this person's just suffering bad luck. He's just he's got a bad roll of the dice biologically. He's not the, e the really evil person who deserves to be punished. Um, well, my argument is that if you understood all of the causal connections that dictate our behavior, you would arrive at that same epiphany with respect to every evil thing that every person does. And what's more, if we had a cure for those causes, right? If there was a cure, right now there's no cure for psychopathy. We just have people who are psychopaths, you know, evil people who are reliably doing terrible things because they're selfish and they, they don't feel the kind of empathy that most of us feel for the suffering of others. Um, well, then, uh, if we had a, something we could put in the water so as to just knock psycho psychopathy just out of the theater of human events, we would do that, and we would then view psychopathy as a condition like diabetes, right? There's no, not much praise or blame associated with having it. It's just, a bad, it's just bad luck, right? Now, your concern is that, I think, that we need, you know, it, we're in this sort of no man's land where we don't totally understand the basis of human behavior, and what's more, we don't have remedies for, for people being bad. Uh, right. yeah. my, my thing is, I, I understand your case with Charles Whitman and, say, maybe right. a 13 Right, but with old. Hitler, it's, it's, yeah. it's hard, exactly. right. And, I mean, I would, I would grant you that there are, on some level, we do just want to do what works, right? I mean, and, and there's, so like, the, the question is, to, the question of whether to punish bad people isn't a question of, about free will. It's not, it's not saying they could do otherwise. The question is, and then it's, therefore it's not a question of them really deserving to be punished once you catch them, because they really are bad. The question is, what are the effects of punishment? And, and in many cases, the effects are what we want them to be, right? Punishment, certain kinds of punishments reliably dissuade people from doing bad things when they're dissuadable. Now, some people are not dissuadable, right? And some punishments are so out of register with the thing we're trying to, to prevent that they derange something else about our society. I mean, if we, we can't make, you know, if it was a matter of capital punishment, for you know, cutting into line at the bank, right? Well, then you know, no one would ever cut into line. But you know, we, we would live in a, in a horrific society, right? And there's some societies that kind of approximate that. I mean, so, you know, there are authoritarian societies like Singapore where they, you know, they they seem to cane you or kill you for just about anything, right? And it's very orderly, right? And so, like, there are people who will talk about the upside of killing people for marijuana possession because it works so damn well in Singapore. Uh, now, I don't think they have it, you know, the dial tuned to quite the right spot there, but uh, again, it, it comes down to 
what sort of world you want to live in. And I think, but, but I think this conversation is only going to be going in one direction. It's not like we're going to learn less and less about ourselves, right? And the more and more we learn about ourselves, it's going to fill in the, the blank spaces on the map in a reliable way, and they, it'll be in a way that makes things look like there's no deep agency, there's no deep, deep responsibility, and there's no bright line between when someone becomes the victim of circumstance, you know, the, the, I mean, the example I often use is, I mean, Saddam Hussein, when he's 40 years old, is a scary bastard who just deserves to be hung, right, because he has, he's made enough people suffer, he, he has this coming to him, but you roll back the clock in his life, well, you know, he's 18, well, he's still pretty scary, and, you know, probably deserves to be hung, right? But when he's four, he is just the unlucky boy who has bad genes and bad parents and a bad society who is destined to become Saddam Hussein on some right. level, right? And, th and the more we learn about ourselves is going to make the kind of the, the timeline look more and more like the boy's timeline right. and less and less like the scary man's timeline. I mean, that's, that's what I would argue, but that... I guess remains to be Brian seen. Brian and so. Sam, we got a oh, we oh. got a minute to finish yeah. up here. If you guys have any uh, final thoughts for the evening. Okay, so sorry, we we just got to the end of uh, the voice of God tells us that we're we're um, time is real. Do you have any, any any closing point that you want to make? No, I'm good. Good. <laughs> awesome. All, right, All right, everyone, please give a big round of applause to Brian coming. Green and Sam Harris. Thank you very much.